Welcome to the Phil and Corey Show, where we tell the story of American small business success through the mentorship of key people, of course. A fresh look inside business every Tuesday and Thursday at noon, Central, live on Facebook. And guys, don't forget that YouTube channel is starting to blow up. I know you want to be a part of that. So go ahead, go over there right now, click that link, subscribe today. We've got Dalton from Salted Oats. Oh my goodness, this guy has got some knowledge, y'all. I'm going to step back. I'm going to hand it over to Phil and Corey. Guys, take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank Dylan. Thank you so much. Dylan Dylan does a phenomenal job every time. We just we love having our hype guy, our MC. Absolutely. So, um, you know, uh, we also, Pecan Ridge is a great sponsor for our show. And they're keeping us healthy with pecans and getting our gifts, uh, corporate gifts out and things like that. Uh, they're a West Texas tradition. So uh, you can find them at pecanridge.com or give them a shout at 806-794-2022. Uh, and then we've got a link down in our description. And do we need to do the other one too? Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. This is next year. Uh, today, we're, today we're sponsored also by the really great folks at All Flowered Up Two. If you need flowers in Lubbock, you know what to do. Call or click All Flowered Up Two. That's All Flowered Up Two O dot com or eight zero six nine nine three zero zero seven eight. And they're really great at all kinds of different flowers. They're professional. Go check out their podcast. We had both Pecan Ridge and All Flowered Up Two on the podcast in the past. Um, so everyone watching live, Dylan just invited you to head over to, to YouTube. One of the things we're going to invite you to do is comment your questions, comment, uh, hey, where are you from? Make sure you let us know that you're here, and we'll uh, try to give you a shout-out. Dalton will answer some of your questions later on, so type in those questions. And, um, you know, if you're, if you're not subscribed on YouTube, it will help us out to reach 100 followers. We can change that URL. So go ahead and go to YouTube and subscribe. And if you're on YouTube, head over to Facebook and, and follow us. We put out the announcements and things like that. So welcome, Dalton. Hey, how are you doing, Corey? We're doing great. Um, you know, Dalton, uh, I know you and your wife work closely together already. Uh, how has everything been over the last couple of weeks with yeah. all the, uh, the virus stuff? We're in that protected group, right? I was listening to President's message the other day about the return phase two or whatever. And he kept saying, those people over 65, they can just stay locked in a room. And I'm like, no, 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 let me out of the room. Oh, no. I need out. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're safe and healthy. We, you know, when we go out, probably you'll see us masked more than not. I've been thinking, you know, what do they do when they reopen banks and everybody walks in with a mask on? Yeah, exactly. I always I I was in Austin and I didn't have a mask, so I wore a um, a bandana. Well, I looked like I was about to rob the place. Yeah. So so this was actually a serious deal, uh, because like for instance in Illinois, their state law states that if you're a concealed weapons holder and you're carrying a weapon, it is illegal to wear a mask. And so it became okay. like a big oh. thing. They actually had to like make a loophole immediately in the law or something like that. Yeah. But, so I took yeah, it's, it's interesting. At Happy State, and I said. What, what significance does this have to you guys? And she said, you know, when a customer walks in, we are constantly watching to see their demeanor just as they come through the door. These are the guys who are behind the teller rack, you know? And they said, we're watching their demeanor. So this totally changes everything. You know, if, if you're from here down and that's all you see, <laughs> it, it makes a big difference. With so anyway, you and I are healthy. We had no sweats, no fevers, no uh, loss of sense of smell. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. We got. Well, a that's chance, good to hear. We ha we got a chance to boogie out to visit our daughter and granddaughter in Arlington, center law, last weekend. That was kind of fun. We had purchased a used vehicle in the end of January, and we were getting thirty miles per week on the, <laughs> that vehicle. It was like the, wow. the gas mileage was amazing. We had never had a road trip or anything. I think we put the first thousand miles on. And yeah. Just last weekend. Yeah, I, you know, like I said, I went down to Austin to visit some clients and and, and uh, get back in touch and keep those relationships alive. And gas has been so so cheap, it's been uh, uh, very incredible. Have you guys uh, interviewed anybody from the oil field or related businesses? 
You know, we, we've asked uh, some groups that we're in, and uh, we haven't gotten a whole lot of response. I think a lot of them, you know, because we're we're kind of asking through LinkedIn and Facebook, a lot of them are out looking for a job, and a lot, sure. a lot of that kind of industry doesn't really uh, grasp, uh, grab onto Facebook as much. And so having yeah. direct contacts is really what we need. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, we, we've kind of reached out to some different, uh, different networking groups. Uh, for sure. sure there's a there's a group great fantastic group we usually meet in person called the oil field connections and uh so that was a group we reached out to but uh yeah well dalton uh, you know let's i guess let's dive into your business and, and kind of give us a little background uh on the business and um uh how you got started with salted oats and uh and why you're doing what you're doing so when you talk to an old guy they always give stories right Oh yeah. When you're and you're dealing with a millennial or somebody that that has less experience, they won't go down the story track. So I won't start at birth, right? I'll start just a few years closer to where we live today. I was a consultant for about ten years with a company out of Albuquerque called De Port Associates, and we worked with Fortune 500 companies across North America. So I did some work in Mexico with Bosch and Bohm because I speak Spanish, and in Canada with that same company, but several companies across the United States. In the end of that, when we moved back to Lubbock in 2015, uh, we had some friends who said, man, I sure wish you could help me out. And at that time, we only had a, a nonprofit that we were doing a lot of ministry kind of work that was in the consulting field, but nothing that was just basically for profit. So we were thinking about how do we do this? And um, I'll mention my son, Seth. We were talking about him a little bit ago the idea of Triz, we were talking about doing something. And my dad, when I started out doing consulting for De La Porte, I was talking to him, I was working with a bunch of miners. I was with uh, my job, I was inserted into a group of people with Phelps Dodge, and I was working with miners and I would work with these supervisors and I was teaching them communication skills and how to resolve conflict and coaching one-on-one -on -one with these guys doing 360s and things like that. And oftentimes they'd say, well, I took your idea and I went and I told my manager about it. I said, I'm really pumped up. And my manager says, shut up. Don't do that crap. The only thing you're supposed to be doing is the stuff I tell you. So just be quiet, move on. And, uh, and when my dad- Don't you love that kind of coercive leadership? Uh, yeah, you call it paternalistic, but it's really more like dictatorship. Not even benign dictatorship. It's more like uh, you do what I say or you don't work here. So I told my dad about, he asked me, so how do you like your job? And I said, I love my job, but it's kind of like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And very quietly, he said, salt their oats. And I almost missed the cue when he said that, because if you think about it, the, the saying is very easy to roll off your tongue. Lead a horse to water, can't make them drink. But if you salt their oats, you don't make them drink, you make them thirsty. So as we were talking with my son about possible names for the company, I mentioned salt their oats. He said, no, dad, call it salted oats. Don't make it a command. Just make it a, a statement of what you are. So the idea of salting oats is we help you figure out how to change the leadership uh, impetus, the movement, the power. It doesn't come from you from behind pushing because that's actually pushing. If you if you think about it, is a management deal where you've got your hand on the controls and you're adjusting and like you do you fly Corey are you a pilot I was uh, yeah I I'm not a licensed pilot however I do have flight hours and I've I've been I've been flying all of my life okay we had a lot of right seat stuff when I lived in the jungle I, I know how to put a plane down without killing everybody uh, <laughs> I guess I guess we're in the same boat then Right, so when you're managing, you're pushing levers from behind, but when you lead, you're drawing. And the idea behind salted oats is don't make them drink, make them thirsty. That's where the name comes. Yeah, yeah I think that's, uh, you know, that's one of the philosophies I really admire behind your business is that kind of uh, leading them, or, you know, you can lead them there, but, you know, making them thirsty and, you know, getting people motivated to do things, um, is very important uh and and you know uh we we both know the uh putting a string on the table and if you push the string it kind of collapses and in, into itself if you pull the string it stays in a straight line and things like that so drawing versus pushing 
and I think that's very important. So that's a, it's a pretty cool story, and I love that your dad brought that up, and then I love that you know you and your son were working on the name for the business. Hey, uh, Lola Davis says hi, guys. Hi, Lola. How are you? Hey, Lola. Uh, um, but yeah, so uh, I guess you know, kind of tell us, lead us down the path of how you make kind of business decisions and uh, what you know because you're in essence i know you know your wife runs the show she is the actual owner of salted oats right so but uh uh you know but she you know you um you run the show and you've got a you're a solopreneur uh what are some of the ways that you have to make decisions i know you have again your wife to bounce things off of but as a business owner you know you help people make decisions how do you yourself make decisions that's cool okay first to correct one thing Sure. Her role, her title is CAO, which is Chief Accountability Officer. Perfect. And what that means is if stuff doesn't go past her, she will be behind me going, okay, did you do this? So she's the checker and make sure that stuff looks good, the quality, um, anything that has to do with essence, not so much the frills and, tr and chills of the moment of the delivery, but how did we get there? She looks at the process and if the process is faulty, the outcome is going to be faulty. So that's, and I trust that man. 50 years in. I'll tell you this, just to butt in real quick. I know that when I've seen you guys in public every once in a while at an event or something, I've actually heard her say to you, hey, we need to take a picture for social media. Don't forget. And so it's a, she's keeping you accountable and making that's sure exactly that right. you're pushing that uh, marketing out. She was, while we're driving back from Arlington the other day, she said, you know, your follow up, it kind of sucks. You, you really need to do some work on follow up with this client and that client. So that kind of stuff, I, I learned to confide in that. Now you asked, how do we make decisions? Part of decision making is influenced by the things that are the crux of the moment. So right now, a number of the clients that we have, we work just great till March 18, and then they were told, shut your business. Well, as you know, training and development is a line item. And when the lines begin to collapse in upon themselves, a consultant is one of the first things that they say, we got to put this on hold. So that helps you make the decision of do you parry and pivot and how do you do that? And I, you've heard the word pivot a lot in the last two months, have you not? Absolutely. I think it's, it's the, uh, it is the it word, right? Yeah. I'd say it's the word that, I mean, Sinek was talking about having somebody on the other day who pivoted within two weeks and her business, she didn't, she didn't, uh, did not lay anybody off in New York City and she's working in an, a world where she can do it this way virtually rather than having to be face to face with people. Well, the idea of pivoting is you have a center point with like a compass on a string, you can rotate around within your decision making ability. And the big thing that he influenced or that he was emphasized signing was that you got to work within your why and so i guess that's the thing i want to say decision making i'm able to identify those things that i can really work on and i realize pretty quickly the things that i can't that lay out here and i i don't spend a lot of time out here trying to gain that business because i realize either i'm not physically able to handle it or i really am not going to help you do that I'm going to I'm going to cause you to slow down on something where you want to zoom past. You will at some point come back to me and ask, how would you deal with this now? But at this point in time, if I see that I can't get into it, I'm not going to try. And... I've been asked, do you do this? And the reality is, these are the things that I can identify and that I really am good at. So that's where I stay. So in decision making, I think if you're trying to mentorship, you know, somebody's listening out there. One of the biggest, thing, biggest things you need to know is not just what your vision is, that future state when you fulfilled all that you want to be and you are that uh, summa cum, there, there's nothing higher than you, but also what is your mission? And when you realize what you do and who you do it for, when somebody tries to leak you into their world, you need to think twice, does this align with who I am and what I do or is it going to divert me? And I might go after this one client to get them and end up being totally off course and two years later turn around and look. And these clients I was serving are gone. And the ones that I chased now says, thanks, I think we got all we can use. And you're back at square one going, oh, wow. 
Yeah, I think it's important to have those guiding principles like you're talking about is like, these are my core competencies. This is my T-shaped expertise. I'm not gonna venture too far outside of my expertise to help a client. Uh, I'm going to recommend someone else or you know help them in some way, but uh, my personal expertise is not, you know, and we've talked about this too, is like, I'm not a marketing expert. There are marketing experts out there. I'm going to make sure my clients get taken care of by not helping them. I'm going to, then, or, you know, I'm not going to personally help them. I'm going to give them 100%, right? Here's how I can help you. I'm going to yeah. point you in this direction, that direction, or that direction. Now, all three of those options are great. Pick the one that most aligns to who you are. Yeah, absolutely. So that's one element of decision-making. Another decision-making element is if you've got participants in your business, so you called me a solo pre- solopreneur, I believe is how you said it, entrepreneurs, the scalability. Entrepreneurs often can't scale because they're limited by their own, uh, their own, that same focus. Point. They've only got two hands. What's that? They've only got two hands, right? They've got two hands. So they've limited themselves to this focus point. Having that outside person that can come to them and say, have you thought about this? And that's where you get whacked upside the head going, whoa, no, I hadn't thought about that. And often that's not working in the business, it's on the business. And solopreneurs, entrepreneurs often get very so tightly wound and their panties in a knot because of what's happening today, that they don't really look down the road a sufficient distance to go, where will I be if I keep this same point of view and this same stress? So outside sources. Yeah. And Philip and I both know, you know, shooting a rifle that uh, that the sights on the rifle, you've got your rear sights and your front sights. And if one's off a little bit, you know, you might be able to hit that 50 meter target. You might be able to hit that 150 meter target, but that 800 meter target, you're not going to hit it because your sights are just off just a tad bit. And actually over time, you're going to be way off course. And so what you just said is, you know, hey, you're fighting fires and you're you're being myopic and you're fit, you know, you're got your nose to the grindstone and you're not really looking out 800 meters or, you know, two to five years or even two months uh, in some cases. So understanding and having a plan is, is pretty valuable. Something I've learned over time. Okay. So I'm 70, I'll be 71 next month. Um, That's five decades older than the people who are walking into the workplace today. Yeah. Right. And they're coming out of school. Some of them are graduating this week, last week. They're listening to speeches about they're the future. I saw one of our friends graduated from a university in New York State, and uh, her 2020 was a two toilet paper roll, two toilet paper. So the 20s were toilet paper rolls. And and so they're walking into the workplace with all these new newly minted ideas taught to them by people who are teaching, but they have zero experience. But you know what? They test your metal when you come with your ideas. And for this reason, my point that I'd like to say, making decisions, I invite younger people in to influence the decision-making process because they're not gonna see it the same way I do. And if I'm not careful, I'll be sitting in a rocking chair, keeping my teeth in my mouth, working hard to you know keep the choppers in place. And I will not be salient or, or capable of attacking issues that are present. So get influence from a generation other than your own. I like that. And, you know, and I'm a big fan of grabbing as much information from everywhere as possible to inform your decisions and and how, how you do that. So I like that. Absolutely. So the generational aspect, right? I'm not a millennial whisperer. I don't have a secret way of getting them to give me information. But what I can tell you is, um, I definitely believe in inputs from other than my peers. That's always yeah. it's always an interesting thing, right? It's kind of uh, why brainstorming by yourself, especially if you're a solopreneur like us, is so difficult because like when you design your logo or whatever, you're not designing it for yourself, you're designing it for your customers, right? So right. it's like, oh, but the only opinion I have is mine. So <laughs> yeah, it, it kind of it, it kind of really helps you out having those other people around. So uh, so so uh, one of the questions I've always I always like asking is uh, 
I was wondering how you use a computer in your business. Obviously, every business has to use a computer for something, even if it's just word processing, emailing, and things like that. But how do you, how does a computer help your business make money? So right now, on the computer we're speaking on, I have five different programs running. Um, in the room that I sit in, I have two Macs. One is portable, one's a desktop. I have a PC because for the nonprofits, I have to do QuickBooks in the accounting world and PCs. I mean, QuickBooks does not like Mac. And anybody who does QuickBooks is gonna be a, a PC version. So I have a, I have a, an El Cheapo PC that I can run QuickBooks on. And computers, if you talked to my wife or if you talked to friends of mine, you would, you would know that I don't want to be on the leading edge or the bleeding edge of technology, but I definitely want to be within a window of six to 12 months of where things are. So when an update comes, for instance, okay, being a Mac user, I know that Apple is gonna find stuff and they're gonna fix it. So there will be updates and I'm set for automatic updates on every device and every, whether it's iOS or whether it's the, the other systems that they create, I don't want those things behind because I don't want to be futzing around with spam. I don't want to be futzing around with people breaking in or hacking. And I also want to be able to use information in a way that I can disseminate it. So one of the programs we have to pay annually for is InDesign because we write material and we create material. And I can get a graphics designer to take my Word document or my my notes or my whatever pages document or numbers and stick it into a, a program and bring out something that we can PDF. But then if I want to fix that and make two adjustments, like got a new phone number, or you could change your website. You got to go back to those same guys and you're always changed. You, you have a dog leash on you to go there. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, Phil. But, uh, you know, if I told you all the different things that I'm running right now, you'd probably go, okay, that's overkill. Yeah, I think, you know, that's kind of the way I'm, you know, you asked me earlier, like, hey, who did your design? And I was like, well, I, I ended up doing it. And one of the one of the things is, you know, time, effort, whatever, you know, you really, you, you have to be a little self-sufficient. Yeah, you can send it out and shop this out, but when it comes back and it's not the way you need it or something changes like a phone number, like you said, you absolutely have to, you have to leverage that technology and you actually have to um, do it yourself sometimes just to get that speed going because you don't have a full team around you all the time. No, we do not. Um, did that answer what you were asking, Phil? Yeah, yeah, quite a bit. Yeah, just, I just I was curious uh, as far as how business owners uh, everyone's got a computer nowadays, and I'm always interested in uh, what what business owners are actually utilizing that technology to do. So, we because we we run websites for two nonprofit ventures and one for profit venture, we're paying for extra speed, which I'm constantly fighting with Suddenlink about. Where's my 400 megs? My MB. <laughs> Yes, right. And I have people out here regularly going, okay, well, it's this problem, that problem, and and, and we're forever. I'm, I'm not gonna. All the money that we put into it, they should deliver, right? And of course, with COVID nineteen, everybody being at home watching the, the snot out of Netflix, kind of mm -hmm. <laughs> the bandwidth gets a little bit hazy. But the the idea of using these tools, I think that a computer can either be a chain which you are, um, because you're not skilled enough, it becomes your master. And this is often a deal we do. We create a tool that all of a sudden we serve the tool rather than the tool serving us. And I think that's where my CAO, Corey Dickey, will say to me, okay, how much time are you gonna spend on it? Are you done yet? Can you call it? Is this, because I do have a small, a mini, that was her Mac that she's not using right now. And that goes with me and I'll sit out in the living room and, and, and she say, how about shutting that down for a little while? We, we need just a little bit of you time. Yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, we talked a, a little bit about that with another guest as well as like, um, you, know, you know what? It wasn't another guest, it was Philip. <laughs> we were talking about, uh, I was like, where did that thought come from? Um, but we were talking about, you know, either simplifying something with technology, which is what it's supposed to do, 
or adding an extra step or adding more work or having this extra thing, this ball and chain kind of dragging you down. And uh, so it's really interesting that you would say that today. Yeah. Um, you know, it's really good that the number of people who are having to work from home had wherewith they could do it. They were trying to figure out, do I sit at the kitchen table or do I sit on the bed to go to work? Um, our daughter is with AT&T in Dallas and she's in the mergers and acquisitions on the international side. And they told them, you may not go back to work till September. You, you probably will be working from home. So she's up at 4.45 AM because her team is in India and in Eastern Europe and in Germany and in England and places like that. So, but because of that ability to work from home, it, it was not a big deal. So computers definitely are a big help for a solopreneur or for large enterprise. The big thing is keeping it safe and not getting yourself hacked out of existence. Yeah, for sure. That's a very good point. Um, yeah, like, and that's one of the things that really gets me is, you know, uh, a lot of what I do anyway, you know, it, it saves the client money. And well, a lot of what you do is if you have to travel somewhere, yes, it's good to go travel and see your clients. But to do that so often, you know, we've got Zoom and go to meeting and all this stuff that we can we can really help our clients uh, online already. Um, and so it, it really is kind of some people weren't there and they had to transition. So what kind of changes have you made uh, for the COVID-19 thing in your business, um, utilizing technology, not utilizing technology? What are some of the uh, things that you've you've had to go through transformationally to pivot? I, yeah, okay, so I'm a face-to-face -face guy. I would way rather be in front of a group of people or face-to-face -face sitting in a room talking about stuff because yes, this gives us, um, I can see your faces, right? And it gives us an aspect but quite honestly, there's a whole lot of nuance that gets lost. And by the way, and I noticed, I, I've read about this, why is Zoom so tiring? You end up looking at yourself a lot. And we don't, you don't do that in a meeting. I don't sit in a meeting and look at me. I don't pull a mirror out and go, okay, yeah, that looks good. Oh, that that would be good. a really interesting meeting though. You guys don't do what that? What is this guy doing? Really? <laughs> He's looking off to the side. That, oh, <laughs> you, put a, you put a mirror app on your phone so you can just, you know, oh, that's, oh, oh, yeah. oh dude. When you look this good, you know, you just kind of do it, I guess. Yeah, it's all magic. <laughs> I was, you know, when you said we we're going to record this, I said, well, I got a face for radio. I don't have a face for video. <laughs> we're working on that, Dalton. We'll, we'll, we're going to, we're going to do the, the audio version uh, because, because I'm in the same boat. Uh, so <laughs> I think one of these uh, days we'll, we'll build some type of better. machine learning AI algorithm to, yeah. to pretty you guys this up. Weekend? I'm sorry, I'm going to change this, the topic, but what the heck happened this weekend with everybody making avatars on Facebook? I mean, and they rolled out you know. a new feat. Okay, so, so they rolled out a new feature, and I didn't pay attention to it because I, 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 I'm embarrassed by how much time I spent on Facebook, and I don't, I don't think I spent much time on Facebook. Yeah. So and, I uh, felt... so, but it's, it's something like you can have a moving avatar. This got started by Snapchat. Uh, one of their, they had like this little tech that was like, kind of like making a me from Nintendo. Uh, if, if somebody remember the Wii, like a little personalized version of yourself. And it used to just be like, oh, well, it's got like my hair color and oh, I've got a beard and look, it has a beard. But now they're getting like, very good essentially it's like i guess it's like an ai that like takes pieces and sticks it together or whatever but um then you can essentially animate that and create weird different things with yourself i guess yeah too much time too much time on their hands people aren't working like they ought to be no i think uh, it's i think it's kind of cool though from a facebook standpoint like it's cool tech because it's well, like yeah. i mean think think about it is like your facebook so you're getting paid per click right for those advertisements and every time you and it's some I, I think they make some money just by showing it yeah but um, but then so think about that i came out with a new feature and all of a sudden i had 25 percent you know upswing in my number of clicks that i sold today like on one day like think about how much money that would make them like even if it's 10 percent, like it, it's really cool tech like <laughs> it's a really cool idea yeah so, that's pretty interesting 
you were asking, so I told you I like face to face. So one of the things yep. we have to do is I've been doing a lot of phone calls. Um, Zoom meetings are often called by other people. So I'll attend those. Uh, when you've got a grid with 40 some, I think, what is it? 49 is the max you can get on a page kind of thing. I don't like Zoom to do full page to c cover my screen because I like to be able to go back and forth between stuff while I'm working. Uh, I've learned a lot of keystroke. There's another techie thing, Phil. I know more keystrokes than a lot of young kids, and they're like, "Why'd you do that? Why you not using the mouse?" Um, <laughs> because the physical presence thing is on a limit right now, it is a little bit harder to close deals because you're having to convince people in light of the ability to push you back. Okay, we'll get back to you on that. Now, you're a consultant, so you know pipeline can be nine months to 18 months, depending upon the company you're working with. Uh, sometimes they want to push stuff to the next budget year. At training and development, anything that has to do with consulting is being a line item. It's really easy to just say, you're extraneous, you don't really, you're not, a, you're not essential. So your hat, show them your hat. I don't think they can see it. Oh yeah, this is the brand new hat. Get put, it put up on Ridge. Yeah, there you go. Um, I'm wearing it somewhat ironically <laughs> um, because, you know, it, and I think uh, D Dylan, if Dylan's still in the room, he may be able to chime in. But um, I think some of the proceeds go to some essential workers. Am I correct in that assumption? Hopefully. Yes, that is correct. 20% uh, okay. of the proceeds of the essential hat actually go to uh, frontline workers. So like uh, hospital workers, uh, e EMS, any of those type of people, 20% of that hat proceeds will go to those workers. Go, go get your essential hat from pecanridge.com. Uh, sorry to make, turn that into a weird plug, uh, but Dalton, but I, yeah. I led you down the road. That was purposeful. Um, so when people, you know, Dylan writes, so what seems to be the struggle people are having when they're, <laughs> and then I'll read the rest of what you said, Dylan. That when they come to me and say, how can you help? They're often coming to me saying, somebody told me I've got to have a coach. I'm, the way it's going right now, I'm thinking me as a business owner, and it can be a multi-million dollar business or it can be just struggling to get up and off the ground running. But that if you don't have someone that will challenge your thinking, it's what you said earlier, Phil, when you're doing a brainstorm with a brainstorming room of one, you run out of ideas and you haven't even that you haven't even filled the whiteboard yet yeah and it's impossible to vet them because there's no way there's no way of like your sample size your sample size of one like yeah that, that kind of sucks <laughs> yeah. so that's where... well and the other the other side of that too and a lot of a lot of times is i can't go to my vp because he wants my seat he wants the crown i can't go ask him these questions <laughs> you know Sometimes right. that's the case. It's not a super often case, but um, but yeah, so sometimes that's some of the things I get. Is people in in the church world, that's one of our clientele. And what we found was it wasn't just my, so that'd be my admin pastor. We've, I've had a case where in one case, the admin pastor was trying to get the, the boss's job. But it's oftentimes it's pastors from other churches that are saying, yeah, that guy fails. I'm going to go get his sheet and bring him over to my my crew. Well, you know, when you when you're max allowed ten people in a room, no biggie. But when they begin open this, this thing up again, you're liable to see that kind of thing happening, where people are struggling to take clients from another location. Um, Interesting. Your your mentality. I'm going to go back to mentality about clientele, and I try and. I try and share this with clients. There's a mentality of poverty, which which says there's a limited number of resources and a limited number of clients out there. And if you've got them, I got to get yours. Yep. There's a mentality of abundance, which says, wait a minute. If I want clients, what I need to do is provide a service in a fashion which appeals to a group of people that right now don't even have a clue that they need my help. Yeah. And so that's where I come from. I come from that mentality. That was Terry D. Laporte. He put that inside of me. It wasn't be worried because somebody else is going to come and do better than you do. You know, they're going to have, instead of having 12 modules, they're going to do 18. Or they're going to have a, a model which is simplified or it's been posted in 
uh, USA Today. And because they got that, they got a name brand. And, and, and the large consulting businesses, you know, the training development industry, when I started into it in the late 90s, was a $2 billion industry. And 95% of it was done out of a garage. I mean, wow. it's a garage business. The big Anderson Consulting and those kind of companies, you know, the guys out of Wichita, Kansas and the surrounding towns that are going through your city and given $69 six hour training sessions where you have three separate modules that they teach for 15 minutes of time and then they spend 30 minutes at the book table. They're making 35% of the book sales. Hello, people. Yep. Amazon. Can you spell it? Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Do not buy at the book table. If you're going to go to those training sessions and, and they're the ones who kind of capture that role, but there's nothing that is modified to your need. It's all cookie cutter. If you fit within the stamped out process, you're good. If you don't, yeah. we'll stamp you anyway, and then you'll be good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think, you know, we were kind of talking about the feast versus famine or a lot of people have a different uh, viewpoint, but even just in marketing kind of having, I've got these two books here that are just fantastic. Uh, the Blue Ocean Strategy and Blue Ocean Shift. Um, but, you know, uh, so thinking about, hey, these are the clients that don't even know they need my help or Dalton's help or anybody's help. Uh, and, and there's plenty of clients out there for two consultants or, or 100 consultants. There's plenty of clients for, for everybody. And if we can, uh, and it's not about the plenty of clients, it's about helping as many people as we can. We keep that mentality. That's a uh, and that's one of the things, uh, again, we agree upon is is having that feast mentality, I think, um, and, and working together in, in a lot of senses, right? You asked, uh, one of your questions you wrote down was talk about your why, just for two seconds. It was really, yeah. funny. Um, I didn't know who Sinek was for a number of years. And uh, one of the clients that I had in Albuquerque is a very young guy. I met him when he was 18 and they were keeping him in the basement of his dad's business, working on plans and projects. And he's now the owner. Um, he said, have you heard Simon Sinek? And I said, no. And he said, well, it's a start with why. And then he talked about his personal why. And, and I got a chance to go to a deal where this guy said, all right, let's sit down and work out your why. And my why is not easily seen here. Here you go. Oh, yeah. Gonna, there you go. It comes and goes because I've got a virtual background. It's to make yeah. sense of things, especially if complex or complicated. And basically what happens is when you and I start talking inside of my head, it's like the guy who comes on a beaver dam and he says, if I pull this log, that'll release this log, which will release this log, which will release that log, which will release that log, which will release that log. Release that log and there goes the water. It flows. And that's, I'm sitting, that's what happens to me. That's natural to me. And it's really, it's really lousy because I can't often enjoy a conversation about a topic because I'm solving. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm in the same boat and it's, you know, I think, and we've talked about this before, I'm more procedural and process oriented and right. you're more the, you know, kind of uh, pulling those logs in maybe conversation and trying to like, uh, figure out how relationships and the leadership style uh, yeah. needs to uh, kind of come together there as well. Uh, and I know we kind of, we definitely do a lot of the same thing as well, but um, yeah, that's uh, it. It's almost like some of the people uh, that I've met that they're film buffs and they've studied film and they like, they, they've ruined every movie they're ever going to watch ever again. Cause they know the storyline. They know, how, how this is going to end and they're like this guy's going to die or whatever and yeah. it's like stop stop ruining the movie uh, but you know they're always their gears are always turning so with clientele a lot of them are also not just film buffs but they'll quote something from a film and ask it did you see that movie and mm -hmm. uh, yeah I probably saw it but I didn't remember that quote and therefore it's like oh gee I gotta go back and review that thing see it again yeah, absolutely. Uh, Bob, Bob Stoll said he's out, uh, but thanks, thanks for the thought-provoking conversation. Um, and uh, we've got a couple of, a couple of other comments there. Um, uh, any, if, if anybody else has got some Q&A, we've got some time for Dalton to answer some of your questions. If you uh, want to type it into um, 
the Facebook comment. I know we've got some watch parties going, so we'll try to answer your questions. Um, you know, Dalton, one of the things we try to ask is kind of lessons learned. You, you talked a little bit about your past and uh, how your, your father kind of uh, led you down to the salt their oats thing. Uh, here, you know, what, what are some of the things that you've picked up along the way that you just think, hey, if I was a younger business uh, you know, owner, I would need to know that. Okay, my mentor when I was a 20 year old kid and moved to the jungle and became a missionary for the following 16 years, he said to me, work yourself out of a job. And I said, what does that mean? Work yourself out of a job means this, do your job so well that you can teach someone else to do it better than you. And then hand it off to them. And what you will find is that they, in doing that job better than you, will set you free to go and do something else. And you will never be without work because people are always looking for who did that that created in somebody else the ability to do something better than self. Most of us take our recipes and we say, this is mine. And we perfect the recipe and we try and desperately to sell that recipe. And what I learned, and that's now, that's 51 years ago that he told me that. And I have lived by that, if you will, mantra or that, that purpose. And what I've found is that I've never been unemployed for a long period of time. And I've never also been without those who said, could you help us over here? So you, as a 20 year old, what kid wants to be the, I mean, I remember I wanted my name in lights. The only problem was there was no plug for the electricity where I live. We were in the jungle. And, you know, so your name in lights means nothing. There's nothing there. So to, to be told, learn how to do this, teach others to do it better than you, that'll set you free to go do something else. That was counterintuitive to my way of thinking, but it mm -hmm. really is essential. Uh, a guy named Sean Kelly, he runs a, a business. He's on LinkedIn. He is out in California, he runs a business that is snacks that are healthy. And he was talking about kindness and the importance of kindness. And uh, that's wrapped up in work yourself out of a job because ego is all about develop my job. So I am so sought after and I'm so important that you desperately have to have me. I don't, I don't know if you have ever followed the trail of the folks who are on the speaker circuit, if you've ever been enticed by that. There's a siren song where the sirens sit on the island and they call you come be a speaker you're awesome just develop that write a book buy 50,000 copies put them in your garage you'll be on the on the first the best seller list on Amazon and it'll be I mean you'll be amazing you only have to invest 10,000 to buy the books and then you become an immediate bestseller and then yeah. they'll want you you see what I'm saying and yeah. the problem is it's all about me and then you've got to keep up that aura which has zero foundation there's nothing built up and so it's empty. And at some point, the whole thing implodes. And then you're looking, where did this guy go? Oh, well, well I'm seeing a lot of that. And that's coming through online is uh, we're you you pay us and we'll teach you about marketing or, you know, and I recently read a book or listened to a book on a road trip that was full of fluff. And this person probably, I mean, they they put their thing in. But, you know, uh, I kept listening to this book for five hours and maybe there will be a diamond in the rough maybe there will be a a tidbit of information here but it was absolutely uh what you're talking about is like there's no structure there hey we're we're enticing you to come write your book and do the speaking but like what what is the foundation what are you speaking about yeah you, you know if somebody just entices you to go out and put your name in lights you still don't have a purpose you don't have a foundation so this has been said a million ways but if you have no values that you actually hold on to, then you have no value to bring to the marketplace. Absolutely. If there's nothing inside of you that distinct, distinctivizes, makes you different from the rest of the crowd doing what you do, then don't do it. Don't, if you can't be better than the guy down the street at that area, please don't glut the market with another wannabe who's read two books or five or a bazillion books and now 
is going to go out and be an expert at it. Um, yeah, I, I, that's what if you have nothing that you value, then you you have nothing to bring to the marketplace that has value. Right. And essentially, any time like any any additional business inside a marketplace and it raises competition, which lowers prices, which means everybody in the entire industry is worse off for you even being there. And being, a, you know, our market is free market here in the United States. Um, there's all kinds of room for people to develop their idea and sell it. And when you, when you get sold on something that is not healthy, you need to be a perceptive buyer. And that means walk in the room, whatever is that marketplace issue, walk in there with your eyes open, having already done your homework. Never buy a car until you know more about the car than the guy who's going to sell it to you. Never, never take a course on something that you haven't researched first to see who would be the expert I want to listen to about this. And who would have something that'll teach me what you were saying, Philip, to find out, is there something brand new in this or is it not? You know, you're talking about TRIZ, for instance, the theory of inventive problem solving. To, to get an instruction on that doesn't mean you took a, a black belt course on TRIZ. It means that you actually have practiced it or developed something where opposing forces came together and you were able to create something totally new out of that opposing force and you figured it out that this is how this works. I, I see that to be one of the downsides to our marketplace right now. We're very swayed by, okay, politically we're swayed by a red or a blue color. Um, we're, we're naturally swayed by, does this go in my direction or not? Here in West Texas, we're swayed by, listen, if a tumbleweed can't blow through it, ain't enough room. We need a little bit more space and less fencing. Um, We've got to have a little bit of freedom of thought and, and I, independence. But all those things bring it back under, uh, I don't want to say this. Don't become chained to the thoughts of other people without first identifying what are the parameters they're going to put you into. Everybody wants to build a fence and put you inside of their box because then you serve their purpose. And if that's Absolutely. the case... You've been you've been sold. You have not wisely bought. Yeah, and I I tried to uh, kind of keep the mentality of the you know the things that um, the things that I recommend or the things that I try to you know uh, uh, sell people on whether it's my products and services or someone else's services and products. Um, you know, I'm not trying to sell you. I'm trying to better your life because of the thing that you're about to exchange money for uh, or, or, and time, right? Yeah. So a lot of what we do, we are solving the problem of, of time, right? Um, and so if we're solving a problem for you, we're making your life better. Um, and uh, you know, th those are kind of the things is like, we're gonna educate you until you're ready to be an informed buyer. Um, and that's just part of our job. That's part of Philip's job as well as, is hey and we talked about this you know philip's not just going to sell you 23 laptops because you said you might need them he, we're going to find the right solution right philip you know you're, you're not uh, uh we're, we're going to make sure that that client is taken care of and they feel like their life is improving because of this uh interaction and transaction i have a story do you have time uh, we got a little bit of time. We're going to ask you about books here in a bit and, and wrap up, but tell your story and we'll, uh, it's about we'll give you the, the it's shepherd's about crook here in a bit. So I were, I was working in a company here in Lubbock when I first moved here, that is a manufacturer. They'll remain unnamed. It's, it was a private manufacturer and it was owned by a family and it eventually sold to another company out of the, and it's still here, but it's under a different name. Uh, for a period of time, the guy who was running the company was not the owner. He was brought in to help establish uh, a kind of governance for the organization. The owner actually passed away suddenly and left his sons in charge and they needed some help. So they brought in this fella who was in his 60s and he was a sales guy. I mean, he was a sales guy. And we were looking for a VP of sales and we had quite a few folks come in and interview and whatnot. And finally they got a guy from Connecticut 
who came in, looked at the place and said, yeah, I can help you. And I, I'm good at this. And his background was in manufacturing sales. And so this, the idea was that he was going to come in and turn around that area and just really burgeon. So we're working there and it was springtime. Uh, so it'd be the end of basketball season. And this guy was a UConn fanatic, University of Connecticut. I mean, he was a nut about UConn. And one day he was standing there by the main window and we had one of those storms where the wind came in first and blew all the dust into the air and then it rained. And it was not just raindrops, he, big old huge rain. It rained mud. And this guy had come from Connecticut where he had trees and he had a very beautiful home, blah, blah, blah. And they had paid big bucks. And this guy was a six figure salary and it wasn't, it wasn't low money. It was big money. And he looked out the window and we had these huge, tall 20 foot windows in the front and he's looking to the north and it's raining mud. And he said, that's it. He went back to his office, picked up his stuff, never came back. He turned around and moved back to Connecticut. Whoa. Yes. Okay. And what <laughs> happened there? Here's the story. The sales guy sold a sales guy on a job. It didn't stick when it came to test time and testing was mud rain well here in lubbock texas we understand mud rain we got right? mud rain here you just, just gotta do it goes in stirs the dust and then the rain comes down and gathers all the dust out and boom there it comes well it was a mud rain he couldn't stay so don't let people sell you you learn to be a discerning buyer that's what you need so you your, sto your story reminded me of something that was really funny uh which was like uh so kind of there's a joke about Midland, Texas, you know, also a very desert landscape, said, well, if you're yeah. trying to convince your wife to move there, fly her in at night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, let's let's really quickly, uh, we, we kind of uh, ask you for some book recommendations. Uh, tell us about A Whack on the Side of the Head uh, and uh, why you recommended that today. Okay, so I'm going to have to turn off this. Here, hang on a second. Let me fix something. You're going to see a different background for just a minute. Here's okay. Something. So this is Von Oaks. All right. And this guy has done kicking the seat of the pants, whacking the side of the head, uh, expect the unexpected. And then he's got some interesting, these are like playing cards. Innovative Whack Pack and Creative Whack Pack. And what he's trying to do is to get people to stop thinking out of their logic side of their brain and work from their creative side of the brain when they're trying to solve problems. So I've opened the Whack Pack. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Even space. So I opened the Whack Pack. <laughs> I'm going to pull one of the cards out, right? And here's what the card said. Out of his whack pack, it says, give yourself a whack on the side of the head. And what he's got is a chain. Let me see if I can get that up there. It's a padlock chain around the head. All right? Hmm. Wrapping the guy's head. And here's what it says. The more often you do something in the same way, the more difficult it is to think about doing it in any other way. So break out of this prison of familiarity by disrupting your habitual thought patterns. Write, and here's how he suggests you do this. Write a love poem in the middle of the night. Eat ice cream for breakfast. Wear red socks. Visit. Definitely got the red socks. I got that down. I've never eaten, I've never written a love poem in the middle of the night. Uh, visit a junkyard, work the weekend, take the slow way home. Sleep on the other side of the bed. And such jolts to your routines will lead to new ideas. How can you whack your thinking? So when you when you pull out one of these whack pack cards, if you're sitting there and you're trying to brainstorm something, what Van Oak is trying to get you to do is stop going down the same channels of thought. You know, we're kind of like cows. When you put a cow in a the pasture, there's going to be a mama out front and you've got a bunch of herd. The mama's going to lead them in some direction and cow paths are never straight. They're always crooked. And the reason why is because that's the route that they got into. They always go the same path. And our thinking is the same way. We have neurons that have crossed certain places that makes a path. So that's what Van Oak is trying to get you out of. Don't do that. Interesting. I love Another it. Another book. 
that I All right, love. So, this guy. so if I if I eat ice cream for breakfast, I can say that's management research. So is that what you, I'm getting out of this? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> And if you usually do bluebells, you probably ought to try Ben and Jerry's or somebody else. There you go. Yeah. All right. Management research. Guys, Gladwell. Yes. Let's talk about outliers. Love Gladwell. Uh, when I read this book, we actually, we were, when our, when our daughter was uh, working on her MBA, we were driving out in California. I sat in the back seat and just read this out loud. It was uh, the first version of uh, audiobooks, right? Yeah. And, what I'm going to tell you about outliers is he identifies for you things that people do that distinguishes them. And some of them are in like the Asian families and the way they work. But I think some of the characteristics of how we do stuff can actually be a benefit to us. We're not realizing it. We need to think about that. I love Gladwell, all of his books. I can't. I can't get another. He tells stories in such a cool way. Absolutely. Now we've got, we've talked about start with why a little bit with Simon Sinek, but yes, let's talk about persuasion. You haven't read that. I haven't read that, but um, why were you persuaded to read that? So my client said to me, I'm reading this book and it's helping me to realize that we actually decide stuff before we do it. We do stuff in very short bursts of influence, boom, we make a decision, it's already, it's like pre-wired. Yeah. So this is why I want to read this book by Cialdini, because I'd like to understand more about what does the pre-wiring. That's, that's one of those, pull this log and the beaver dam is we're, we're getting it busted loose. Well, very fantastic. Uh, and we talked a little bit, I've already, I've got this book and it's same author, um, uh, influence the psychology of persuasion. And so he is an expert on that subject, it seems like, right? I've read that book. Uh, it was a very good book. And he's got it, several other books about the subject. So, I mean, uh, I'm excited to go ahead and order that and uh, start, uh, start reading that as well. So maybe we'll have to talk about it later uh, and uh, get back into it. Cool. Guys, thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we love to have you, Dalton. Uh, and I think this was a lot of good information for business owners. Uh, so if you're if you're just now joining us, we're wrapping it up. But, you know, you can start this back over. Uh, you can go follow us on on YouTube and uh, get get all of all of Dalton's package, uh, you know, decompress a little bit and go back in and, and re-watch some of this because I think that was a lot of great information to kind of uh, to absorb and, and to take some notes and things like that. Oh, seriously, my notepad is absolutely full. So, Dalton, I'm sorry. I may be bugging you so much on Facebook this next week. I'm sorry, man. You just gave me so much to think about. So that's your fault. That's all on you. Hey, guys, another great Tuesday, we oh, have good. always Kyle Jones. He's going to talk retail, so I'm definitely going to be there for that. And on oh, you guys are doing it to me again. Okay, on Thursday, we got another classified guest. I don't know what's in store, but I'm excited for it, as I always am. Hey, are you guys tired of your technology keeping you away from the parts of your business that you love? Let Rob Technology Group take care of your business's tech so that you have both the time and tools to focus on you and your business. From support to virtualization to networking, the veteran-owned and operated Rob Technology Group enables the success of your business with custom-made solutions, guys, that actually work. Call Phil today, call him today, pick up the phone, call right now, call Phil today. 806-224-4380. Stop working for your business technology. Have it start working for you. That's why it's there for. And y'all know my man, Corey. Love my man, Corey. His Lubbock Consulting since 2016 has helped shape the way businesses approach for providing solutions that help their clients become more efficient, more accountable, and more profitable trying to make it rain, y'all. If your business is struggling to grow, struggling to keep up with growth, or just can't seem to get its overhead down, you need to level up. You need to email my man, Corey, at Lubbock Consulting. Corey at LubbockConsulting.com. Wow, guys. I can't wait for Tuesday. Thank you so much, Dalton. This was awesome, as always. Yeah, thanks, Dalton. Thanks, Dalton. Thanks. We'll see you later.